The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Our aim is to explore the fringe, lost civilizations, alternative science, the paranormal, and much more. Join us on the web at WhereDidTheRoadGo.com, where you can send us questions for our live or future guests via email or the live chat room. And remember to subscribe to us on iTunes. And now welcome to this week's edition of Where Did The Road Go? Yes, welcome to Where Did The Road Go? I am your host, Soraya, as always. And tonight we're going to be talking to Mike Cleland. And uh, how you doing, Mike? Very well. All right. Uh, before we get into your stuff, I, I, last week we had to run a pre-recorded show. You were originally going to be on, and I had to switch them because of weather here. Um, but in the last couple of weeks before that, we actually lost two pretty major personalities in the paranormal fields. We lost Lloyd Pye and Colin Wilson uh, almost about a week apart, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and that's uh, we had Lloyd Pye back on the show right before he had gone in over to England to get some... Uh, treatment for the cancer that unfortunately eventually killed him never had the honor of speaking to colin wilson uh i don't know if you're familiar particularly with either of them you know i've never read anything by colin wilson uh, though i've certainly heard of him and i did actually very briefly meet uh, lloyd pye at a ufo conference in uh this would have been in arizona and i saw him speak and i i had never i've never read any of his books but i've heard him speak on um you know his star child skull uh, yeah. theories and and i remember being you know he was very tidy very formal in his presentation and um used a lot of documentation like uh you know powerpoint things about the uh the actual uh, technical scientific research that had been done on the on the material specifically the dna material within that skull itself and it was um you know i found it was interesting i thought he made a very strong point yeah, as did I. I mean, I didn't, I didn't necessarily agree with his sort of uh, jump to conclusions as to what the skull was, but I fully believe that he had an anomalous skull there that we can't easily explain. Yep. Yeah, and that was my sense, too. And, and I think that's true of any researcher. Like, I'm very cautious when anyone comes to a conclusion, and then I'm very engaged when anyone is, uh, you know, proceeding forward or talking about their experiences or talking about their research, the conclusions, um, I mean, I guess you have to sort of come to some sort of conclusion in a way, but, uh, you know, those I, I put less trust in and I'm, and I'm absorbed and, uh, there's something very seductive about the stories themselves and the, and the research itself. Yeah, well, that's, that's also true. Uh, I think once people jump to a conclusion, it, it makes it hard for them to see all the evidence for what it is. Yep, and, yeah. it, and, it, and it puts you in a little box, too. Yeah, yeah, and it's not always that people do it intentionally. I think that the, the, most people who do it are very well-meaning. They just don't realize that they've kind of taken a path without realizing there are other paths. Which is human nature, and that's fine. Yes. And I think that, that I feel like at this point I'm a oh, you know, a big boy, and I can kind of, you know, understand that and, and factor that in and listen to people's conclusions and, and uh, drink it in and, and see what, you know, what feels right. Um, though, you know, it's interesting, you know, you go to a UFO convention and every single person has a different conclusion. Yeah. Uh, none of them match. Um, <laughs> and so that, in a way, means nobody's, or well, maybe there's one person that's right, but then you got to pick that one person. But my sense is that everyone is kind of wrestling with trying to describe, um, you know, it's like trying to describe smoke or something like that. It's this amorphic, uh, fleeting, dissipating set of concepts that are almost impossible. I think we're almost, I think we're almost hardwired improperly or like you know we're almost hardwired in a way that we're not allowed to fully understand as if you know we can't peer into some other realm in order to know uh you know what the the totality of the the, of the phenomena really is yeah yeah oh very much so um alistair crowley in talking about religion once said that uh religion's like a mountain and it's seen from different people from different sides with different paths to the top but it's it's still the same mountain with the same goal and i think when you look at the ufo phenomena and the paranormal in general you might be having the same type of thing going on 
we're all seeing different trails up that mountain, different things along the way, but it's the same mountain. Yes. Yeah. It's the blind man. It's the five blind men and the elephant, you know, each describing the elephant a different way. Yeah. All right. Well, why don't we, uh, why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself and uh, you're an illustrator as well, right? That's my day job um, mm -hmm. is uh, doing illustration, oftentimes very cartoony illustration. Uh, I used to do a lot of stuff for magazines and then uh, lately it's been more and more for, you know, little book projects, mostly instructional books involving skiing or camping or climbing um uh, so anyone if anyone out there has a, a rock climber i did uh, the illustrations for climbing magazine for, for about 12 years um mm -hmm. and that would have been in the 90s and in the 2000s um and then um and then you know the research that i've been doing has been focused on the ufo abduction phenomenon and how it um how it is I guess this, what I'm drawn to are the very, very strange stories that, 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 that force me to conclude that the simple explanation for what may be going on, um, you know, that, uh, you know, I think we all have a, uh, like a pop culture vision in our, in our, that has been embedded into our psyche on what the UFO abduction lore actually is, or might be, let's say, uh, you know, from late night TV documentaries, you know, scary you know, blue lights and reenactments with, you know, little rubber uh, aliens and, <laughs> and uh, people being pulled from their car with, you know, with, you know, gloom and doom music. Um, and those things all, I mean, you know, obviously those are reenactments, what I'm describing here, but those, those elements are, are all get described, but surprisingly not as often as, as other things. And it's, it's interesting that we, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the other stuff, the very, very weird stuff would make, for poor TV, you know, it makes for a, yeah. for a, for a lousy sound bite, but where there's much more going on from all my direct discussions with people who claim the first hand experience, um, there's much, much more going on and it is much weirder than, than, uh, you know, if it was just little, you know, alien scientists flying here on a metal spaceship, uh, and then, you know, performing experiments, uh, the same way we do that in you know Yellowstone National Park with bears, um, if it was just that, um, then then there wouldn't be all the outlying weird, irrational you know almost psychedelic experiences that people are reporting. And and you know if it was that if it was just extraterrestrials visiting us and, and performing experiments and stuff, I think we'd know by now. I think at some point we would have had the proof to support that idea by now. It's been happening, you know, in the modern tradition since the, the late 40s. It seems like something would have been that, that smoking gun piece of evidence at this point. Yes. And, and, you know, if you, I mean, who knows if, you know, if you follow certain uh, lines of thought and, you know, people have argued, you know, I consider forcefully and, you know, made their point that there, there very much could be that smoking gun evidence, but it's locked away in, you know, secret vaults uh, under high security by the by the, you know, elements of our own government. Right, um, right. That may or may not be true. Uh, so, and I agree that there is, now in my sense, just from talking to people, like I don't need the smoking gun evidence. I, I feel like I'm absolutely convinced from my own s sightings, as well as from talking to so many people with, you know, weirdly consistent uh, stories that um, what I can say with, here I will come to a conclusion here, um, what I can say with absolute conviction and clarity is that something is going on. Um, I can't go much beyond that. Uh, anything else would be just conjecture and speculation. And, and that's the exact same way I phrase it, that the, the one thing we can say for sure is something is going on. And, you know, you get some of these closed-minded people who call themselves skeptics, but they're really debunkers, and they'll say, well, there's nothing going on. Everyone's just hallucinating something. And it's like, yeah, that's not even a reasonable explanation behind it. Agreed. Agreed. But um, now, you uh, <laughs> people tend to know you as the owl guy. I have, yeah, that's, that is, I have become the owl guy, and in fact, if you, if you um, Google uh, UFOs, owls, 
uh, my name is the first thing that comes up like five times at the top of the list, <laughs> and uh, which is fine. I mean, if you're going to be known for this, it's, it's, I'm, it's, I'm totally content with all that. So, uh, and uh, the, the reason is because I had my own set of owl experiences, um, and then as I got into you know writing and doing the online stuff and doing these little audio interviews that I do, um, you know, one of the questions I'll ask and sort of pose and kind of ruminate over with people is. Um, you know, what's up with all the owls? And some people have no owl experiences and don't know what I'm talking about. And others have, you know, very, very rich and detailed owl experiences. So it's not 100% across the board, but people, oh, it started out specifically focused on the abduction stuff. Um, People who have experienced the direct contact will, with some regularity, not 100%, I couldn't even begin to guess what percent it is because I'm convinced that the, the folks arriving either at my email inbox or calling me on the phone or, you know, however they arrive, you know, the information arrives. I'm convinced it's arriving somewhat synchronistically. So that certainly skews the, 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 the data pool. So, um, but my sense is that, uh, you know, some probably large percent of the, uh, of the experiences the owl experiences are somehow connected to the abduction lore. And, and, I, and we spoke a little bit before uh, the, the interview started, but there's also, it overlaps with people who have near death experience. It overlaps with people who have had like the death of a close friend or relative. It overlaps with people who take a lot of mushrooms and have a psychedelic uh, like um, uh, spirit journey. Um, it overlaps with people who have had uh, profound, um, let's say, emotional breakdowns or, or spiritual awakenings. So these owl, the owls aren't just focused on the, on the, you know, the UFO abductee. They're, they're, they seem to be tapping into like a larger pool of people who have had extremely significant and powerful uh, experiences, transformative experiences. And it and it seems to me that those things may all, on some level, be connected. I mean, you have uh, Whitley Strieber's work has been talking about how people like there are death experiences connected to UFO experiences, where people have abduction accounts where they see dead relatives. Um, you have Kenneth Ring's work, where uh, the Omega Project, where he shows that people who had UFO experience abduction experiences and people who had near death experiences have some of the same after effects. And so it makes you wonder if, and, and, you know, Graham Hancock did a great job in Supernatural and showing the shamanic connections to UFO connect, to ex, UFO experiences and such. So all these things may be some version of the same reality. Yeah, my sense is that it's a, that the soup, you know, the big pot of soup is, you know, uh, if you get myopic and only focus on one of the ingredients, you're missing the, the, the larger picture. That, that's a really good analogy. Yeah, and at the same time, the soup is bubbling, and, and quite honestly, you know, you put the ingredients into a pot of soup, and, and it, they change. You know, they, they take on yeah. a different form. But, I mean, there has been, you know, enough work to say that these things are in some way interwoven in ways that doesn't that, that, that doesn't make sense if they are extraterrestrials, I guess is the best way of putting it. Now, you know, one thought is that they very much could be extraterrestrial. They could be coming from a, another planet, physical beings on board a craft. But something within their uh, propulsion system, let's just go with like the actual physical propulsion system of the craft, may be so exotic that it may disrupt time and space and, and consciousness and reality in ways that we can't comprehend fully. Um, and then if... For instance, the, that uh, let's say, and this is this is, comes from discussion I've had with a, a woman. Uh, her name is uh, her pen name is Lucretia Hart. She has a website called At Spirals End that's amazing, and she's been documenting her own firsthand experiences. But um, you know, if um, let's say a flying saucer lands in someone's yard, and the little gray aliens like walk through the wall, and they they're creating a portal or a distortion in reality that Mm -hmm. allows them to walk through the walls and this gets reported with great consistency uh Mm -hmm. that what the after effect is is that people will be plagued by poltergeist experiences uh you know electronics won't work correctly in the house um and could it be and i this is what this is total speculation i have no proof of this but it is interesting to, to to contemplate could it be that the um that the effects of these 
craft of this dimensional doorway of whatever I you know I don't even know what quite what it is but you know could that disrupt the fabric of our reality that that attracts owls that attracts synchronicities that uh, creates uh, psychic abilities in the in the observer which is another thing that's very consistently reported um, so you know, so it could be just that they have a you know a fancy motor that disrupts our reality, and then <laughs> then these things that we call magic just start appearing. It's nothing more than than some sort of exotic physics that we haven't uh, grappled with yet. No, well, I mean anything's possible because we don't know the answer, so we can't say that's wrong. Yeah, uh, exactly. And and uh, so so you know you know the extraterrestrial hypothesis saying that they might be from another planet is. You know that's a good as starting point as any, but to be locked into that, I think is is uh, is you're you're selling yourself short, and you're going to get stuck. All right. Well, do you want to tell people a little bit about your experiences and how it led you to the whole owl thing? Um. So I I'm 51 years old, and I had a handful of experiences uh, in my youth. Uh, one of the experiences I had was seeing a uh, flying saucer in the nighttime sky. This happened with a friend. We saw a very clear, this was out a window, out a second story window, a very clear, what I can assume to be metallic uh, structure. It was shaped exactly like a coffee can, a uh, little bit of beveled edges, and then it had like uh, what would be a pencil sticking out the top of it. Um, and this was rotating at a very weirdly smooth way, sort of a liquidy smooth way that it was rotating. And it was it was descending in a way at an odd angle that wouldn't couldn't possibly be a helicopter and we saw it very clearly it wasn't like it was some you know distant twinkle off in the distance it seemed like i mean if it was huge it could have been far away and if it was rather small it could have been rather close my sense is it was probably about the size of a van um and then um it poof it disappeared and so i had that experience as a 12 year old boy i don't have an exact date on this but my guess is it was 1974 uh and then later that same year, in the autumn of 1974, I was um, walking home from a high school football game. I would have been 12 years old at the time, uh, with a friend. Uh, we got to, we knew I knew exactly what time it was when we left the football game. The high school was very close to my home, so um, that was what all the kids did on a Friday night. So, uh, but I wanted to get home in time to see a television show you may be familiar with, which is Cole Shack the Night Stalker. Oh yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so I, as I was you know, a geeky little 12 year old kid. And I loved that show. So I, I, um, you know, I wanted to be home well in time. So I should have been home around nine 30, uh, given the time that I left the football game and we got to one spot in the neighborhood. I could put an X on the map on the sidewalk, right where it is. I know to the millimeter where I was standing. And, um, uh, and there was this odd flash in the sky, uh, and we both talked about it like wow that was very strange it felt like the entire sky lit up orange it felt like god took the light switch and just lit the sky up you know clicked the switch on held it for a second clicked it off totally silent very jarring and um it was a rich deep illuminated orange i remember that very clearly that and I, even to this day when i look at the the coals of a campfire um i'm i'm reminded of that that color uh, so we get we talk about it, you know. We say, was it a meteorite? No, that doesn't make sense. Was it an explosion over the horizon? No. Could it have been like a like a power lines zapping each other? Then no, that didn't make sense either. Um, so we got home, and uh, now he had to walk a little further into the neighborhood to get to his house, and I, I, I was the first house we passed. So I went in, and my my parents were um, uh, angry at me for being out so late. And I was like, what do you mean out so late? It's 9.30. I was, I'm at home in time to see the show. <laughs> and they pointed at the clock and they said, no, it's 11.30. Now this was, this was, uh, you know, a decade before Bud Hopkins had come out with a book. So, um, uh, and coined the term missing time. So there was, it didn't even, I never even crossed my mind. It was just this odd right. thing. And I remember being a little bit annoyed at my parents for being angry at me because I felt very strongly that I had done nothing wrong. And, um, and, uh, and that next Monday at school, the other kid uh, said that he had seen a UFO. And that took me by surprise. My initial reaction was to think that he was lying. He said, yeah, we saw a UFO with lights and everything. 
and um, you might hear my cat meowing. She's she gets all uh, jealous whenever I talk to to someone, <laughs> so she wants to be in on this. Um, so if you hear meowing in the background, that's my cat. Uh, but um, so I had those experiences. I also had an experience in uh, the winter of ninety two, ninety three. It would probably would have been January or February of nineteen ninety three. And I was at home. I was living in Maine at the time. It was um, uh, the middle of the night. I woke up. There was a bright light shining through the window. And uh, I sat up in bed. And I looked outside. And there were five spindly gray aliens right up against the house, like very close to the, to the window. Um, and then behind them, they were backlit by this bright light. Uh, now, I don't know exactly how long I w- looked, saw this. My guess is 30 seconds max, maybe 20 seconds. And I was I remember being weirdly drawn to the light behind them rather than them in the foreground. Um, and the light, and it wasn't like there was a great big flying saucer or a craft or anything landed. There was just a, something about the size of a washing machine sort of creating this light um, off. And this was, you know, the snow on the ground and... And then I heard a voice in my head say, and I'm not sure it could have been my own voice, but I heard a voice in my head say, now is the time to put your head on the pillow and go to sleep. Um, Hmm. And then I put my head on, excuse me, now is the time to put your head on the pillow and shut down. That is actually more accurate. That's actually a more accurate quote. And then I put my head on the pillow. Poof, I was out. The next morning, I dismissed it entirely as a dream. I never even bothered to go out in the yard and look at the cipher tracks. Um, I just, it was irrational. It didn't make any sense. So I just treated it that way. Uh, in later years, I've been, I've been, I I feel now that, uh, there's a high probability that, that there was some sort of real experience that night that involved, um, you know, me actually seeing something. It was also weirdly distorted. Um, in dream like is a, is a, is a safe term, but it wasn't a dream in any comparable to any other dream I've had. Um, it was um, hyper clear. It was more real than real. There was kind of this vividness to this, this hyper vividness to it, and a, a weirdly quiet quality to it, and a weirdly quiet quality to my own to my own mind, as if the, um, like all the knobs that, that control just normal, uh, you know, brain chatter were all turned down. You know, and and I was just in this state of clarity, um, and I have ex- felt that in a few other occasions, and each of those occasions involved something to do with this, this UFO stuff. So, um, I, I, I'm trending to believe that there was a very real event uh, at this point in my life where, if you had asked me, this is now 20 years ago, if you would ask me 20 years ago, you know, what I thought, I would have said, ah, it was a weird thing, but it was it was probably a dream, and I'm I'm not. I've changed my tune since then. Um, well, that, now, that that sounds a lot like just an altered state of consciousness to begin with, but it also sounds a lot what, like what people uh, describe when they have near-death experiences, that sort of hyper-reality. Yes, and there's a term, there's a British re- UFO researcher named Jenny Randalls, and she coined the term mm-hmm. the Oz Factor. Which is and, a great, great term for it. Yeah, so it sort of implies this magical land uh, this magical realm. And, uh, so she had been in her reporting and I've also heard it many times from folks that, um, the, uh, actually just being in the physical proximity of a UFO can in many cases create this, uh, what's very consistent is people will almost across the board report that it is the, the UFO is not only silent, but everything becomes silent. You know, the crickets yeah. stop creaking, the wind stops rustling in the leaves, the birds stop chirping. Um, and uh, so, you know, that reality itself becomes eerily quiet. And then also there's a distorted sense of, of, of clarity, like if things become extra clear. Yeah, so, uh, you know, and I didn't know any of that at the time. Um, I've since been immersing myself in the, you know, literature and books and stuff. So uh, I feel like I'm... I'm you know, almost flooded with too much information in my brain at this point. <laughs> okay, and beyond that, you're, you're the the next thing on your adventure. Well, the next the next thing would be um, now 
I, so those three stories that I told, the, the UFO sighting, the missing time, as well as the five aliens in the yard, I could tell that story around a campfire or at a dinner table and, or among friends, and I could just like totally blow it off. Like, oh, isn't that funny? Uh, there came a point when I realized I needed to look into this stuff. I needed to focus on it. I needed to, to I recognized the implications. So this would have been about 1996. And it was just building and building, and, and I felt like I needed to explore it. I needed to to not be so adamant with my with my denial and to, to see if there was anything there. Um, this, in a way, culminated with the event uh, that I'll share now. The, the, uh, uh, there was a f- young woman in town. Uh, she worked at the same um, place that I work for part of the summer. I work at an outdoor school teaching camping. And... Um, and it was the end of the summer it was getting to be fall and i had been away all summer um, up in alaska and um, she had been here in my hometown which is right outside of grand teton national park and uh i said oh you've been here the whole summer you must have been hiking and camping a lot and she said no i haven't camped once this whole summer and I'm like, oh that's terrible uh, listen i go out camping all the time if uh, I'll, I'll give you a call the next time i go out camping and she said great so a couple days later i i called her up and we went out for one night and this is something i do a lot um, I just can, you know, the, where I live, it's, uh, we have access to beautiful terrain. So just in one night, I can leave the door, I can walk into the mountains, I can sleep out under the stars and come back home and, uh, and then just it be refreshed. And it's a, you know, it's something I enjoy doing. So I right. called her up. I said, hey, let's go. So we packed the, the bare minimum of stuff and with a weather report said no rain. So we didn't take a tent or shelter. So, um, just walked into the mountains and, and, uh, uh, now there came a point. Now this was a this was pretty much a complete stranger at this point. I, I didn't know her, I barely knew her at all. And um, I was sitting on a rock, big flat rock, cooking, which is what I you know I'm very comfortable in that environment. Cooking on a tiny little camp stove, making something for dinner. She was sitting across from me. The sun was setting slowly. The moon was rising. It was an incredibly beautiful spot. And there came a point in the conversation when I was like, man, this. This woman is smart. This woman is, I'm, I didn't realize it, but I am impressed. Um, and at that moment, an owl flew over us. Hmm. And then a second owl. And then a third owl. And these three owls flew around us. They landed near us. They landed on tree branches above us. They would, they would swoop down right above us. They would, and this went on and on and on until it was totally dark. And we laid our sleeping bags out under the stars and, 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 uh, so lying in your back, looking up at the, you know, we were up at, a, up in the, up high in the mountains on a crystal clear night. It was spectacular. But what would happen is the owls were still flying above us and they would swoop down right in front of our faces and blot the stars out for just that one second. Was, and they were very quiet. So it was positively eerie. Um, so we were both the next day we were like, wow, that was so cool. The owls, whoo, that was cool. So, um, <laughs> and I said, Hey, listen, if uh, I, I do this a lot, I'm going to go camping all the, I like. I like doing this, and, and if I do it again, I'll give you a call. So a couple days, this is actually four days later, I called her again and said, let's go out. Let's go camping. So um, we did it again. It was colder this night, and we went to a totally different spot in the mountains. Uh, we had a shelter set up. So it was cold and kind of windy and gray, and I said, listen, let's see that hill over there. Let's walk to the top of that hill. We'll watch the sunset. We'll come back down, and we'll climb into the, the tent, and then we'll be a little warmer because we'll have warmed up from just walking up the hill. You know, at that point, it was just kind of, you know, it was not unpleasant, but it was cold enough that we were just chilled. So we walk up to the top of this hill, and as soon as we arrive at the top of this hill, three owls arrive. <laughs> and they sit on branches, and they fly around us, and they stand on the ground looking up at us. And now this is something that I, I am very, at the time, I wouldn't have said this. And I'm going to say it now, and I've, and I've written about this, but my senses, my very strong senses, the voice in my head was saying, this has something to do with the UFO stuff. This has something to do with the UFO stuff. And, you know, that was right in the moment with the owl, like, standing on the ground looking up at me. Um, uh, to have that happen once was pretty cool. To have it happen twice within four days with the same person was positively mystical. Yeah. Now, I... I wrote about this I, I, in 2009, so that would have been 2006. Now what that did is I can trace my, my uh, looking into my own experiences right to that owl event. That owl event sort of pushed me off the cliff and forced me to, uh, to, to look into my own experiences. 
the young woman, um, her name is Kristen. Uh, she, she was also one of the people that, um, was very good about listening to me. And actually she was the one person that was perfect because I was saying like, Oh, I told her that, like, it was after all this that I told her the experiences with the, that I just told you initially those three events. And, and I said, I need to, man, I think I feel like I need to look into this, but I just can't. And I'm just, I'm stuck. And she, in no uncertain terms said, quit your goddamn whining and do something, <laughs> uh, which was exactly the advice I needed. So, you know, uh, like I, that, that, now, that is an important element to this whole story. So I started an online blog. I started initially just writing about synchronicities. Then I started writing about the UFO stuff. And um, and I wrote her the, the owl story up that her and I shared. Now, she, um, she said something to me. I remember very clearly she said something to me just before the first owl appeared. It was something important. and changed my way of looking at her. And, and I couldn't remember what it was, so I called her up. And I said, you know, Kristen, do you remember what you were saying the moment the owls arrived? Because I can't remember, but I remember it was something important. And she said, oh, I remember exactly. I was defining my deepest feelings about what God means to me. And that, that one element to the story, like, adds a level of, you know, mysticism to the whole thing that, that I can't ignore. Um, so, so, uh, so I've shared a few stories here, what the, you know, the, and the timeline, if you look at the timeline, you know, leading up until that point, um, you know, I had these odd experiences. I blew them off. I denied them. I ignored them. After the owl experience, I could no longer ignore the UFO experiences, though, though there was no UFOs, obviously the night the owls were there. Um, but it was that event that, uh, you know, I sort of treat the, the owls as an alarm clock almost. Um, and they, in essence, woke me up. Now, since that point, I have seen so many owls. I've talked to owl <laughs> biologists and sort of said, listen, uh, here, this is what's happened to me. And I've started to tell one owl story after another owl story. And I have a bunch that kind of, that one, the one I just told you is very clean and clear. And it's a good example. But I have others that are equally good examples. Um, and uh, and they kind of, you know, literally they'll kind of move away from me like I'm at the, <laughs> you know, the creepy uncle at the party, you know. And uh, and so uh, so since then, in the research I'm doing, and the people I talk to a lot on you know, a weekly basis, I'll talk to a handful of folks um, who all have this either owl or UFO experience. And, um, you know, I have. Been, I'm at the point now where I'm convinced they are somehow intertwined. I don't understand quite why or how, um, but there is some sort of connection between the owls and the UFO abduction experience. And why do you think that was the event that triggered all this in you? You know, on a big, giant, cosmic, you know, I and so I'm going to get, like, you know, way into sort of bong hit territory here, but the... Uh, uh, you know, my sense is that there were, whether it was my own inner self or whether there were forces behind the curtain of reality that recognized that it was time for me to, to take that step, to move from not knowing to, I'm not sure that I know anything any better now, but I do know that something is going on you know, from, let's say, from denial to exploration. That seems like a valid way to say it. Um, and uh, and then it's interesting because 2006, 2006, 2007, the folks I'm talking to, the folks that are arriving at my inbox, again, oftentimes synchronistically it feels, um, that year, 2006, 2007, shows up over and over and over again to the people I'm connecting with, uh, where there are a lot of people that are telling not in, not quite exactly the same story, but a story that has a similar flavor and certain key components of these stories will, will drop into place right around those, those uh, years, 2006, 2007. Now, is it a synchronistic thing or could it be that this phenomena has cycles? Because, I mean, we see UFO flaps on certain cycles. John Keel wrote about all kinds of cycles of UFOs and stuff, like when they were most likely to be seen, the months that they showed up the most often. And then you have uh, work of people like Paul Devereaux, who has shown that these things happen most often around fault lines and, and ley lines and things like that. So maybe there's also a cycle to the phenomena. 
uh, very much could be. I haven't seen much evidence of a grander cycle. Um, you know, that would mean, in a way, I would have to hear a handful of stories of people saying, you know, let's, I mean, wherever it comes in a you know twenty year cycle, so that would have been. Uh, 2006, 1986, I guess, would have been the, the years that people would have to have be saying that they had their, you know, kind of awakening experience that involved owls and UFOs. Um, I haven't heard those stories. Hmm. They may be out there, but I just don't know about them. Well, it might also be a pattern we're not aware of. Sure, yeah, and that's the thing that, like, like no one is doing the, the, the research, as far as I know. No one's crunching the numbers, you know, like, no one's, you know, I mean, this is, uh, Jacques Vallée said something to the effect of, this is like, you know, you know, sophomore statistics class in college, you know, you just, you know, let's, let's get a bunch of data, put it on a, you know, word or a spreadsheet and crunch the numbers a little bit and see what patterns emerge. I'm sure they're out there. Um, you know, I feel like I'm only so, I'm, I'm so focused and so myopic almost to a fault that I'm like, you know, peering through the, the microscope when there's a big, uh, you know, totality of stuff like swirling around me. And I'm focused on this little teeny tiny, you know, fractal corner of, of this bigger set of weirdness. So, uh, yeah, so that, that, that would be, I'm certain there are odd patterns and patterns that would be fascinating that, are, that are, you know, embedded within all of this. Um, you know, I just, I'll, you know, the only ones I can speak to are the ones that I'm seeing myself and right. those may be certainly flavored by my own, uh, intention as well as like the way synchronicities are, sort of welling up around me so so the pattern that i'm seeing you know the the researcher down the road who's focused on you know with an equally myopic uh, obsession you know maybe focused on who knows you know like the shoelaces that are reported on the on the uh, ufo occupants and, and he's probably having his own synchronicities involving shoelaces and he's getting his the reports on flooding into his inbox about you know people who have had you know uh, experiences with shoelaces so I'm using that's a bad example, but I just you know right, but it works. Yeah, it gets the point across. All right, well, we got to take a quick break. We'll be right back with Mike Cleland. The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com where you can send us questions for our live guests via email or the live chat room. You can also check out our upcoming schedule, blog, link section, book reviews, videos, and links to our Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, and much more. That's wheredidtheroadgo.com. And we are talking tonight with Mike Cleland, and uh, I should remind you that not only can you hear us live on WVBR every Saturday night, but we are now a part of the Dark Matter Radio Network, and that airs, uh, we, the same show will air midnight Sundays, Eastern Time. Uh, we're also a part of Deprogrammed Radio, with a lot of our older shows being run during the week there. You can always, of course, subscribe to us on iTunes or YouTube. Uh, and uh, you can always just go into the archive and download any show since uh, the beginning, which is we're coming up on a year anniversary for the show. So, uh, Mike, we were talking about synchronicities. And uh, for people who maybe aren't aware of what synchronicities are, do you want to try and to define it a little for them? Okay, synchronicity is a term coined by uh, Carl Jung, the psychiatrist or the, I guess, psychiatrist, yeah, from, from the... Uh, uh, he was a student of, or a peer of, of Freud's, uh, and he died, I think, in the late 50s. I think so. Um, yeah. But he, he coined the term synchronicity, and it, um, there's actually a very formal definition, I should know it off the top of my head, where um, a, a profound coincidence that is meaningful to the observer that cannot be easily explained um, occurs and so that would be the term synchronicity and and he kind of uh said it was you know due to forces that you know we can't understand i, I don't want to paraphrase for him but um you know so the shorter definition of synchronicity would be a meaningful coincidence i um, you know i think we have coincidences all the time you know things happen simple things happen that that we can just brush off as synchron or as coincidence right. the the when it has an emotional or or spiritual or deeply personal uh, impact on on you as the individual, 
uh, that would be the, a synchronicity. You know, oftentimes synchronicities, I, I sort of say, are like dreams, where where it's really hard to, you know how some you have this really interesting dream and then you try to tell someone about the dream and you just see their eyes glazing over? Uh, <laughs> I, I feel like synchronicities have that same, uh, that, that almost the same problem occurs with synchronicities because like at any good synchronicity, I'm convinced, is tends to be a little complicated. You know, there's like so many layers. It's not like you can just tell a synchronistic story in two or three sentences, you know, because of that, the, the power they seem to have. You know, you have to tell the backstory, the event, and then what changes. Uh, and, uh, and, and I've since at this point started to treat synchronicities, UFO sightings, and owl sightings or owl experiences. Obviously, this doesn't fit exactly, but this is, you know, sort of as a thought experiment. I'm treating these all three the same. Um, where quite often there's something leading up to the synchronicity or the UFO sighting or the owl sighting. The event happens, and then in the aftermath, something changes. Something changes in the individual, um, you know, whether it's a change in direction of their life or a change in the way they think about reality. Um, you know, I can't, it's what is very commonly reported with, uh, and that's one of the questions I ask when I, when I, talk to, to people who have seen you have a ufo report one of the questions i'll ask is what were you thinking about right before you saw the ufo and curiously enough what people will say is i want to see a ufo that's what they were thinking <laughs> right before they saw a ufo or they were saying something to the effect of like i need a sign from the universe you know that like i'm i'm stressed out i'm ang i'm anxious there's like i'm in a place of existential longing i need a sign from the universe um and then a ufo will will appear in the sky so um and, and you know, that so, actually it, that actually is something that happened to me about a month and a half two months ago oh can i, I hear it I, I literally looked up into the sky and said I, I, a lot of times i'll do it and just ask for a shooting star like kind of like if i'm on the right track show me a shooting star and within a few seconds i usually get a shooting star in this case i said show me a shooting star or something odder and I got a very odd UFO display a few seconds later, and I went, okay, that was weird. Good enough. Oh, so describe the UFO display. Well, what I initially saw was a shooting star, and it moved from, um, from east to west across the sky. And where it disappeared, there was suddenly a moon-sized light, and it kind of appeared like a clock wipe on a, on a video screen. So it kind of started and then expanded clockwise until it was a perfect circle of white about the size of the moon, and then it disappeared. A few seconds later, a shooting star came out of that portion of the sky, went north, and ended in another one of these big circles of light. And after the first one, I had actually looked away, and I went, okay, are my eyes playing tricks on me? Because I know I saw the shooting star, but maybe that second part was like a glare in my eye or something. And then I looked back and it did the second part. And then as soon as that light disappeared, another shooting star appeared where that light was, shot east a distance, and then disappeared in a ball of light. Wow. And so what happened afterwards? Any sort of change? I mean, you were asking for a sign. Did you treat, you know, I mean, you know. Well, it, you... It, it improved my mood. Oh, good. Well, that, you know, that's, <laughs> that's important. Yeah. Now, you said a clock wipe. So I'm picturing right. like the like a you know like on a editing program you wipe exactly in exactly like that. So now, are you familiar with those editing programs that have clock wipes? Yes. And then it appeared to something that like it appeared in a way that was familiar to you. Right. You know, so. It's I mean, just I'm not just not not familiar as a light in the sky, but the the way it appeared was familiar. Yeah. That's so to me. That's interesting. So to me, like, and I'm here. I'm going off. I'm totally, you know. This is I'm front loading it with all kinds of my own weird baggage and and um, but you know to me that implies potentially that this experience was orchestrated specifically and deeply personally for you with a curious little special effect that you would have some intimacy mm -hmm. with you know whether you know if there was a housewife that was uh, you know. Uh, loved uh, baking, you know, it could have appeared in the sky like a, like a, you know, a muffin rising in a, in a, in the oven. I just made that sure. up. That's a terrible metaphor, but, um, but you see where I'm coming from. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think you're right. I don't think it was something that I just happened to see. I think it was something that was shown to me directly. And, and I you don't... were coming, you were coming from a, a point of intention. Right. And I don't know if someone standing next to me would have seen anything, if they would have seen the same thing or 
if nothing would have happened because somebody else was watching. Yeah, I, yeah, these that those, I, I wrestle with that too. You know, one of the questions I ask people who see very close up UFOs, um, um, and I will say, you know, like if you threw a rock at it, would it clonk off the outside of the of the of the craft, or would it pass through the craft? Yeah. as if it was just a mirage or a hologram and uh, and with 100 percent, you know people are saying like oh it would just it would clonk off it would make a noise but i mean that that's my sense is that like some of these events might be taking place in some sort of ethereal or projected realm whether it's a piece of technology projecting it or whether it's some sort of psychic phenomena that's projecting it well have, have you ever read uh demonic reality by patrick harper no he postulates a sort of in-between world uh, that he actually calls the imaginal or the imagination that is a literal existence that intertwines with us. And he feels that this is where a lot of paranormal ex and UFO experiences come from, and they kind of dovetail into our reality, but they're not in a solid material form when they're in that imaginal state. And then I've actually heard UFO witnesses with a lot of personal experiences say that the and this sounds like we're talking about the same realm they'll call it the astral plane or the imaginal realm and they'll say that it's in this imaginal realm where the craft travel that's how they get from point a to point b that's when they turn invisible when people see a craft you know blink out oftentimes people will see a craft blink out and then yes and then they will say but i knew it was still there um and then the the there, this one individual I'm thinking of, you know, spoke quite convincingly that the um, that the craft themselves are going into this imaginal realm, and she also said that this imaginal realm is is like the in between realm between our reality and then some grander reality. There is this little uh, thin little layer of reality that 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 butts up against these two realities, and that that we can travel in that realm uh, through astral travel, through outer body experiences, and also that's where um, uh, uh, remote viewing takes place. It is through that little corridor, that little, that thin little barrier between our two realities, the, you know, the, the, the uh, remote viewers are accessing that. And now, I don't know if this is true or not, but I think it's, it, it, when she told me that, um, it, 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 uh, I just thought that was such a clear way of seeing it and so many things that i've been struggling with seem to fall nicely in place that doesn't make it true but i just i i, I like that metaphor you might want to check out patrick harper's book uh, actually i interviewed him back in uh maybe july i think about the whole thing he it's it's i'm not doing it justice as part of the problem so it, it might be saying that you might find interesting his view on it yeah oh yeah um as well, are you aware of, like, uh, George Hansen's work on liminality and such? Sure. I mean, I, I have actually George Hansen's book downloaded on my Kindle. It's kind of hard to get into. It's not yes. easy reading. No, and, not in the slightest. Yeah, so, but I have heard him. He's a very delightful uh, person to listen to, and he's got a, there's a handful of stuff online where you can hear him interviewed, and he makes a very forceful, and he's got a great presence when he speaks. So, yes, so so his, um, you know, a trickster in the paranormal ideas uh, though he doesn't address the UFO issue that much, no. it's, it's another one that sort of, you know, that you sense it's that he's describing the same pot of soup that that you and I were struggling with right at the beginning of the interview. Right, right. I do think I, I did interview him as well early on in the show, maybe in March of, la of this year. Um, and I think we got a little bit into UFOs. Uh, I might actually be thinking of David Metcalf, who we discuss liminality and the ufo phenomena i don't remember off the top of my head yeah and in, in uh uh agreed yeah but i mean there does seem to be something to that in-between state that both paranormal and ufo phenomena seem to really flock to or appear in yes and this is actually one of the things that i'm i'm, I'm happy about this the research that i'm doing on the owl stuff is that um you know initially i started just focusing on the uh, you know the UFO abduction and how it interacts with this you know uh, owl stuff, and you know it didn't take long before I started getting stories that were outlying, in you know outside that very confining box, which I thought was great because it, it you know it forced me to recognize that there's a uh, you know like a meta umbrella phenomena that's 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 
uh, that encompasses all these smaller parts. You know, each of the small parts have their different flavor. You know, a deer death experience is different than a UFO abduction, but well, they have they so. have overlapping uh, themes and overlapping uh, results and such. Yeah, and, and after effects and overlapping after effects. And I suspect, though, I don't have any. You know, my suspect that that would go right into the same thing that I was talking about with, you know, what was what was going on right before the event that yeah. was leading up to it. I suspect, I don't know if people are asking that question, but that would be a question I would ask. Um, and I have no, asked I, people and they're all like, oh, I don't remember. I was only five years old, you know, so uh, I think had near-death experiences, yeah. Uh, well, I think the near-death experience is harder to ask that with because chances are, well, I was dying would be the answer. Um, but with a UFO experience or a paranormal experience, I think it's a very, very important question to ask. Then not many people ask it. I mean, it's interesting because I, I have the move on forms, you know, that uh, Mutual UFO Network, uh, you know, they have a little checklist and it's for the most part really good. Um, you know, they ask all the qu right questions as far as like, you know, what the you know time of day and the you know size of the craft and did it make any noise? Was there, but and then there's a few uh, questions in there, not enough for me, uh, that basically, you know, well ask, you know, was there any follow up uh, psychic ish? You know, did anything? Mm -hmm. Uh, follow-up psychic stuff but not much so um you know and that would be a question i would add too is like what were you thinking right before what was going on in your life leading up to this event well i, I think also that they don't approach it from a um they approach it from a more physical nuts and bolts ufo type of standpoint so they're asking questions probably more along those lines than along the more metaphysical lines that you're looking at it at and the now my thought is like i mean I mean, any fully aware, <laughs> being a little judgmental here, but any fully aware person <laughs> who sits down and talks for 10 minutes about the UFO thing, it is not going to take very long until you're contemplating, you know, the meaning of God and, you know, why are we here on, you know, like you're going to, it's going to lead to the deepest metaphysical questions. And if you are stuck in that nuts and bolts mindset, you have to, you have to actively deny a lot of evidence. You have to you know, dismiss with contempt. Well, no, it's not dismiss with contempt. That is very judgmental the way I'm saying it there. But you, you, you know, it is, if you are not seeing the metaphysical side of it, it is not by accident. It is because you are willfully ignoring certain elements of the overall weirdness. Well, and it's just that cognitive dissonance, I think, that happens with a lot of people. I mean, especially if they built a theory that, that falls into a, a nuts and bolts idea, to admit that it's something more than a nuts and bolts idea is very difficult for them. Yeah, but if you built a theory that, you know, like the Earth is flat, you know, you're going to, you know, there's going to be a day when, uh, you know, you have a root awakening, you know, so. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. there are still people who believe the world is flat, so. Yeah, they're probably working for MUFON, so. <laughs> uh, so, um, actually, one of the things I wanted to, to talk to you about while I have you here is, um, I guess you. I mentioned Paul Kimball earlier, and uh, when the last time I interviewed him, we talked about the UFO phenomena and uh, the role of hypnosis and such in it. And I had quite a few comments of people saying I should have you on to talk about the role of hypnosis. Oh, good grief! People actually pick, use my name and stuff yes, me. yes. Okay, so I listened to that interview, and, and I've met Paul. I've talked with Paul on the phone. We're Facebook friends. Uh, he he approaches this stuff. He would probably disagree. If he was right here, he would disagree. Oh, no, no, I don't do that. But he approaches it. He was a lawyer. I mean, that was his training. So he went to law school. And so he huh. approaches it like a like a lawyer trying to win a case, trying to prove a point <laughs> and solve something and win a case. And I just, you know, think of, uh, you know, uh, you know I, what's uh, Perry Mason or something just, you know, saying the just perfect thing that, you know, makes the witness crumble on the stand and then, you know, the, the case is solved and stuff. So he, that's how I, you know, I'm now I'm being, again, being judgmental, but, uh, you know, so I, I don't, I can't, I, that doesn't interest me at all. Like I know full well, I ain't going to prove anything. And, and all I can do is explore the stuff as honestly as I can. And, um, you know, and if I say something that sounds pretty far out and pretty weird, you know, then, but I mean, I'm, I'm, in the role of speculation. Now, I have actually attempted hypnosis three times with three different um, hypnotherapists. Oh, and uh, one of them was Bud Hopkins, hmm. one of them was Leo Sprinkle, and one of them was Barbara Lamb. So Leo and Barbara are pretty much on the love and light, you know, flowery new age end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And and Bud is, you know, would be considered, you know, 
by some to be more grounded and um and more you know he, he has a much darker overall vision of the entire issue right um now i could never be put under that doesn't mean i can't be put under but i'll tell you i was so nervous each time i was so <laughs> nervous each time uh that it was not a peaceful experience trying to go under um a few things came up some of it peripheral that didn't have anything to do with the the ufo stuff um that i thought was very interesting uh, one, so I talked, so I explored that event um, with the missing time on a uh, that Friday night coming home from the football game. Right. And I sat with Bud, and beforehand we knew we were going to talk about that. And I took a little piece of paper out, and I said, "Okay, here's the football field." And I, you know, walked here, and we, you know, come through these, you know, this this, you know, baseball fields that are connected to the to the high school, and then from the baseball fields, I walk th- here through here, and then I walk across this one lane road, and then I get into my neighborhood, and that's right here where the event happened. I put a little X on this, you know, penciled map on a piece of paper, and in the hypnosis session, he's like, "Okay, visualize your friend," and like. I had the clearest image of this, you know, red-haired, freckle-faced kid, and it was sort of jarring. It's like, what am I seeing this little kid for? It's like, oh my gosh, that's right, we were 12 years old. And it was <laughs> so clear, it was so vivid. And then uh, I uh, proceeded, we went through this gate, and that was interesting, because that would have been, I would have been 12 years old, there was some construction, and they moved some fence or something like that. So that gate was gone when I went to that high school for the four years. So I, I mean, I had not thought about that gate. I mean, who, you know, like, why would I ever even let, can think about that gate? But I so clearly saw that gate that you just walk through, like the fence, um, you know, to get to the baseball fields from the football mm-hmm. field, and so that was, you know, very interesting. And then um, we got to the road, which I called a one-lane road on the map, and I remember blurting out, "It's a four-lane road," and going, I went back and checked on Google Earth, and yes, it's a four-lane road. And so that was that was interesting. So these things, you know these things were being confirmed these very physical real tangible things you know a gate uh, you know a person a boy who's you know 12 years old in a in a in a four lane road you know but what happened is we got to the x on the map and it just felt like the vcr froze someone just hit the pause button and and bud hopkins who was a very very sweet guy uh tried every way to you could see him. Okay, now we're going to pretend like we're watching it on TV. So now you're watching it on TV. You're totally outside the realm. You're watching this experience on TV. Now explain what happens. And I'm like, uh, nothing. We're standing there. We're frozen. And he's like, <laughs> you know, and and so it and it was, and he just couldn't get me past that. So eventually we just moved on. And and as I left his his home in New York City that afternoon, um, he said, you know, Mike, I've you know I've hypnotized a lot of folks and i've done this and i've seen some folks who are blocked and you are blocked uh and some people i've told that story before and then people were like oh that means bud was like you know adding judgment to it and he was you know he was uh you know acting irresponsible and and and, and causing you to believe you were blocked and and i feel like whatever i feel like i'm capable of you know recognizing right whatever a, a nice man saying something you know in a way that felt honest. So, you know, he, I, I respected that he treated me so, um, he treated me so well. So that, you know, enough to say that kind of stuff. Now, uh, I don't, you know, it's, you know, so here's the, the thing that you look, I got books on my shelf, you know, there's books by Bud Hopkins. There's a bunch of books. So there's like huge long stretches of some of these books that are all transcribed hypnosis sessions. Um, I know some people who have been hypnotized and have, interesting experience i also know a handful of people who have been hypnotized and then they come out of it and they say you know what i didn't believe it i didn't buy it uh i have never met anyone who then i that doesn't mean they're not out there but i've never met anyone and talked to anyone that has had a deeply traumatizing experience because of the hypnosis most of the people i've talked to have said you know i went through this hypnosis and it, it really helped um now also most of the people i'm talking with and explore you know like like really having strong heart to hearts um have never had hypnosis and then but they're at the same time telling stories telling experiences that how to say it you know if you put the puzzle on the on the table right and you're missing some pieces so there's you can stand back and look at the overall you know uh you know scene and there's some puzzle pieces missing you can infer what is probably in that that missing spot 
you know what I'm saying? So you don't yeah, have to have yeah. the, you know, if it's like a, uh, you know, a beach scene, you can see like the, 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 the bow and stern of a sailboat and a little tip of a sail coming out the top. You can probably infer there's a sailboat in there, um, but you don't know where those puzzle pieces are. Um, now, uh, uh, so the folks I'm dealing with, the folks I'm talking with, for the most part, have never had hypnosis. They are dealing, struggling with very odd experiences that certainly imply what might be called the UFO abduction phenomena. Now, I um, and and I've, I'm very close with uh, Peter Robbins, and he has, uh, uh, you know, he's an advocate of the use of hypnosis. He's sat in on potentially thousands of hypnotic regression sessions along with Bud. I don't, I'm making that number up, but I know it's a huge number, um, well into the hundreds. And, um, you know, he is a strong believer in it. Um, my sense is that the, the hypnotist could be leading the folks. It may not show up in the transcript, but I'm, like, totally open to the fact, I mean, two people in a room speaking quietly to each other, one person very focused on uh, uh, getting information, the other person in a hypnotic trance, I mean, it is not beyond me to think that there could be some sort of ESP telepathic mind link that takes place in such an intimate environment where where that's where the leading takes place, not necessarily in leading questions. Because, I, cause, uh, um, you know, I, I, w the times I've been under, which was very brief and I couldn't get past some things, I totally recognized when Bud was asking me questions that were purposely misleading. He would ask questions that would purposely direct me away from the real subject. And I would go, no, no, it's not like that. It's like this. So, um, so he couldn't easily lead me away. And I didn't feel like anyone was manipulating. Um, and are you familiar with an author named Mac Tonys? He died in 2009. Yes. I yeah. was actually pretty close with Mac. We spoke on the phone a lot. Um, and him and I, which I haven't done, but it was, seems like a good idea, uh, sort of talked about the fact that that was right at the point when I was starting to look into this stuff and I had had a few hypnosis sessions. But I, um, you know, it would be really interesting to sort of go in, like, like I would, in a way, offer myself up for this the same way that, you know, like the Vincent Price in some mad scientist movie would, you know, he would drink the potion himself, um, <laughs> you know, to go and get hypnotized by a, a wide variety of hypnotic uh, therapists, you know, folks that are very, very clinical and dry and don't have a, you know, much of an, a, of an agenda, and then folks who have a very strong agenda, whether that's, you know, openly hostile to the aliens or openly lovey-dovey to the aliens, and, and just to see if there's something that emerges that's, that's different. So, and I also yeah. feel like I'm at the point now where I'm, like, I feel like I've really explored the experiences that I have had, which aren't many compared to you know, a lot of folks that, that have these claims, um, you know, I feel like I've explored them in enough, enough depth, in enough, excuse me, in enough depth that, uh, that I, that I, and I also feel like I'm, like, I would be skeptical of anything that came out under hypnotic regression. Like, I wouldn't just be a, a I, I hope not, or I, mean, I, I know myself well enough to know that I wouldn't be like a, just a doughy-eyed true believer. You know, I would be just right. as skeptical of the stuff that emerged under hypnosis um, as any other, you know, perceived unusual experience. Hmm. So I, so I don't have any scientific background or data to 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 debate uh, uh, Paul Kimball, but I do have like what amounts to sort of emotional and and uh, curious aspects to my own nature that makes me uh, intrigued by hypnosis. I'm sure it's flawed in the same way that any other anything is flawed, um, and you know the testimony that comes out hip under hypnosis should be taken you know cautiously and not be treated as gospel. I know some people do treat it as gospel, and and that's I can't change their mind for them but i know how i would feel um and i, I know how i treat the stuff that i read in in uh, the ufo abduction literature that you know page after page after page of transcribed hypnosis sessions um i'm cautious to to treat it as you know uh dogmatic truth because i don't think it is but i think it's it probably is a, i mean it's the same thing as if you're a you know if you're the detective and you're uh uh, uh investigating a crime right and then you know you you, know, you talk to some people and one person says like, oh, you know, like, I'm not sure, but I think I saw the guy run over there around the back of the, the, the house, you know, and he threw something in the bushes, you know, like I would check the bushes, you know, like right, that's, I mean, right. you would have to go through that, that secondary 
thing and saying just like, oh, we've solved the crime. You know, there's something in the bushes, but we're not going to look. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a good way of putting it. And the fact, like you said, what, what you thought was a one-lane road turned out to be a four-lane road. Which matched reality, though my, my initial perception was that it was a two-lane road. Oh, two-lane road, okay. Yeah, I mean, that was when I drew it on the map, and that was my initial like memory of that road was two lanes. And then it was like, no, it is actually four lanes, and, and it very clearly four lanes, and I remembered that it made perfect sense afterwards. And, and I think my, my personal view of it is I think hypnosis can be a useful tool. But like you said, you, you have to kind of take it with a grain of salt because it can be embellished on. And, it, and you can lead someone the wrong way, even if you don't mean to. And, um, sh you know, I mean, you're also, I mean, it, memory is, I, I don't think, I don't think the human mind is a, is a, you know, a digital hard drive that is, yeah. you know, has information locked in place. I mean, I think all that information is just as malleable as any other kind of uh, of of information that's stored in the brain. And and you know, as I'm uh, writing about my own experiences, one of the things I found as a pick, you know, I used to write anything that really weird happened. I'd write down as many details as I could as soon as I could, so I I would have it in the freshest version possible knowing that memory isn't perfect and when i look back i find that i i have the majority of the experience correct but there are little details like people might be switched i might have thought this person did this but it was actually someone else so minor things but still variations on what really happened and that should be expected that should be yes. that's totally normal and i think that any you know cop or any you know prosecutor would would say the same thing you know that like you know if you get two witnesses and they describe things exactly the same then you know that a red flag should go up um you know there should be minor differences and and things and what has happened to me is i've been using this online blog that i have to document my experiences as in in essence real time um you know shortly after i have the experience i'll write it down and what i find is when i go back you know i have like, I feel like I'm a kind of a polite person and I'll undertell an experience just because it's, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to embellish. I don't want to, so I'll kind of like tone right. it down a little bit. And I just think that's kind of my nature to do that where other people, I think, do the, just the opposite where they'll turn it up a little bit. And, uh, and I, whatever, I'm sure I, you know, have a, some big fish stories where I, you know, tell the fish bigger than it might be. But, um, <laughs> but what I do find is that when I go back and look at my own writings, about events that I've had that I, I have forgotten the, you know, some very interesting details and there's more going on in the story that I wrote in the moment than I, that I, than I would remember, you know, so I'm, yeah. I'm trying. So what I'm finding is that the, you know, the stuff that, that happens is there's details like, Oh my gosh, that is right. It happened on a full moon. Isn't that interesting? It happened on a full moon. And I forgot all about that, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I find that as well. You remember like the main sort of archetype of it, well but it's the details and some of the other things around it that seem to get lost yeah and, and then i think that that's the only advice like i'm not like when people say like what should i do i'm having these experiences and i'm like okay i'm not a therapist i'm not a psychologist i'm not a professional any of those realms here's the one thing i can say with with without you know i can i can give this advice you should keep a journal and write everything down just yes. write everything down even if it doesn't feel right if it feels kind of like peripheral it feels sloppy who knows those details may reemerge at some point in the future so just write it all down document it as best you can and not just the experience but as you said what's going on around it what was happening right before what happened after after effects you know what you were thinking at the time because that stuff does matter yeah yeah. I mean, we're, not, we're dealing with something that has some level of subjectiveness to it that reacts to us. It is deeply personal. Like, yes. Like the, there's a deeply personal aspect, not to all the UFO experiences and not to all the owl experiences, not to all the synchronicities, but to some of them, there are deeply personal aspects. And I think these are, you know, that to me is where the ring of truth comes in. You know, that to me is where the, you know, that's the stuff that I find the most seductive, you know, th those stories. And you're on WVBR FM Ithaca. This is Where Did the Road Go? And we're talking at the moment with Mike Clellan. The last exit for the loss will be up in just a little bit because um, I still have some questions for you. Um, we didn't really get too much actually into the owls, and I think we should talk a little bit about that. What do you think the connection? Wh why owls? I guess is what I want to ask. Oh yeah, yeah. So that's a question I can't answer. Mike and I could speculate and, and try to answer it. So. Um... 
we talked a little bit beforehand, and I'm not sure. Did, did I talk about uh, the the screen memory aspect so far um, on the recorded show? I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so I did either. Okay. So so um, within the UFO abduction lore, there is a consistent story that shows up over and over and over again, where a uh, like a typical story would be. Um, you know, a person is driving down the road late at night, they're alone in the car, they turn a corner, right in front of them, standing in the road is a four-foot owl. They slow down, the next thing they know, they're driving again, they get home, and they're home, uh, let's say, two hours late. I've heard that story in one form or another so many times. And, and I've also heard a few stories where people have had hypnotic regression, and then they'll say, in, under the hypnosis session, which again is like, not well, it's you know it's it's a it's a imperfect uh investigative tool let's say um where they say that that the after examining the owl they realized it wasn't an owl they were looking at it was a it was an alien it was a, one of those big eyed gray aliens uh and i have some uh, some really funny stories like that there was one in that i have that I, there's an essay that i posted online there's a woman again her name is lucretia hart and she's got this site uh, at spirals end and and uh and i i lifted this uh, story for this essay uh, right from her right from her blog. Now she would have been 19 years old at the time. She was working in a summer camp. She was walking. She had had a lot of experiences at that point. Her life was very stressful. She was freaked out. And couldn't sleep, and you know all the typical things that someone who's had uh, you know intense contact would would tell. Um, so she's walking along this path, full daylight, uh, bright sunny day in the forest she's walking alone she's actually close enough to the summer camp where she can hear the girls at this girls camp you know kind of uh you know behind her at the spot she left so she was going to get something i can't remember the, the what she why she was walking but she she comes around a corner and she looks into this opening this clearing and there's a gray alien like the classic gray alien with the big black eyes full daylight she's totally 100 percent conscious she sees this thing standing there in the the field right next to the to the trail um it sees her she sees it it kind of goes and she hears this this voice in her head that goes owl 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 and she watches this thing sort of morph into an owl and then start running into the woods and uh and she said it was even though the owl like even though it turned into the owl there was still like the shiny bright sunlight on the big round bald head uh, it was, and it was, there's, so there's sort of a funny aspect to that story, but, um, so there's something that, that is at play where the UFO occupants or the aliens or the visitors or the beings or whatever vocabulary word you want to use are somehow interacting with the, with the individual through either psychic means or, or technological means, but they're somehow in there creating some sort of screen projection that the person thinks they're seeing an owl. Um, and so once again, that back to that where people see a four foot owl in the road. I've heard that so many times. Owls don't get to be four foot tall. People have talked about pulling right up to the owl, and the owl looking over the hood of the car, and their head, the big owl head, staring at them from over the hood of the car. There's no owl on earth big enough to 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 do that, um, hmm. you know. Uh, and so there, that you know that just simply doesn't match what a real owl is. So there is that aspect to. The, the phenomena where these owls are showing up. Um, there's also real owls that are showing up. Uh, here's a perfect story. It was in the uh, there's a guy who contacted me. Got an interesting. He's in. I guess it would have been 1994. He was in out in the desert outside of Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, watching the beautiful stars. He was camping with a handful of friends. Two friends were sitting out, just chit chatting and talking about you know. Uh, whatever and they were looking up at the stars while everyone else was asleep they then all of a sudden they noticed hey there's a there's an owl on top of that cactus big tall cactus looming above them the owl standing on the cactus looking down at them uh, uh they look at it for a while they're like wow that's such a cool thing to see we're seeing an owl that's great the owl flies off minutes later a giant triangle ufo flies silently above them and you know they watch it they, it comes from behind them, flies right over them, and then they watch it, you know, fly down uh, off into the distance. Uh, I have that story 
in one form or another. Our story is very much with that flavor over and over and over again. And I don't quite know what to make of it. You know, that it's it's not like obviously it's not impossible to see an owl, right? And campers go out in the woods and see owls. It's it's something that happens. But to be in such close, you know, timeline to the to the UFO sighting uh, means something. Another thing that is happening is people will have uh, like a UFO contact experience. There's a fellow named Chris Bledsoe who had a very traumatic contact experience, I think in January of 2006. It might be 2007. But right after that, you know, his son was involved, other people were involved, multiple witnesses, people in town reporting things, giant UFOs in the sky. He had uh, three hours of missing time. His son had three hours of missing time. There were two different spots. People were in all these different vantage points. They were seeing things differently. Um, most of the stuff, there was no hypnotic regression involved in any of these events initially when the reports were made. Um, he got home with his son. They were seeing beings in the yard that night at their house. So super trippy, super scary story. Um, he shared it with his family. He was, he was, uh, you know, sort of alienated in, in by initially by his family. They've come around to since then, but now, uh, so he holed himself up in this back room of his house, room with a couch and a TV. No, you know, he's like totally depressed. You know, the community had had was ignoring him or thought treating him as he was crazy. So he, and right after the event, so he's locking himself in this back room of the house. These owls start living in the bush right next to the window of this room. Uh, also, uh, he had he built a uh, CB, like he had a CB radio system there. So it was a shortwave and a CB radio that he would use to talk to folks. And um, he built a tower in his backyard. Someone had actually, uh, since the advent of, advent of the cell phone, you know, like places like, uh, you know, the power company and stuff would use CB radios and they would have their own tower. But so, so he, they basically said, if you want to take this tower away, it's free, it's yours. So he built this, he took it down from their site, put it up in his backyard. So he had this 140 foot tall tower in his backyard. And he said an owl would, would, would be seen. He would see an owl hanging out on that tower. And that was different than, it might have been one of the two owls that were living in the bush. He never quite knew. But um, he always got a bad feeling from that owl. Full daylight sitting on that tower. Um, he had lived in that same house or the house next door his entire life. So that's about 50 years of living in that same spot. And I asked him, how many owls have you ever seen in the yard here? And he's like, never, never saw them. They arrived right after his contact event. So... Uh, on his huh. on his anniversary with his wife, he um, he's in the back room and she's like, you know, come on, Chris, time to go. They were going out to dinner, so he leaves the room. He's out on the front porch, and then boom, this colossal lightning strike hits the tower. It follows this great big fat cable that ran into all his electrical equipment. The corner of the house exploded. It blew up, lit on fire. He lost all the paperwork that had to do with his case. He lost all his, you know, and basically he said if he was sitting in that room, he would be dead. Um, so the entire corner of the house blew out, exploded out. Um, and after that event, after the explosion, he never saw the owls again. So here's this, like, you know, I, I, I don't quite know what to make of that story. I mean, it has all these odd kind of, you know, like almost an, a premonition of something bad was, you know, w could be seen in those owls. Um, you know, why the owls were living in the bush right outside his window, right after the experience. Um, and I have, that's a, that, the owls arriving at a home of an abductee right after a powerful experience and, and hanging out for weeks or months is, a, is common. That is, I've got a lot of reports of that. So, and I, I trust very strongly that these are real owls. They aren't little gray aliens that are using a screen memory. Right. Um, you know, what is the meaning of those experiences? I don't know. I mean, they could, that, it's up to the, I, you know, I don't know if there is a meaning, but I do know there is a vibe. There's kind of a spooky campfire story that's associated with these, with these owl sightings that I like, you know, that I find interesting and I want to explore. Um, and, and sadly, I don't have any good answers to what, you know, maybe behind that. Is it a archetypal energy that the owl embodies that is presenting itself the same way that if a shaman said you know oh i need to like you know help my village i'm going to go into the woods and get a sign and then maybe an owl would land on a branch near the shaman the shaman would interpret that owl 
in you know depending on its traditions and such in in some way are we adrift without those shamanic um, traditions yeah yeah so so I, you know i don't i don't have a good answer to what that might mean and and one of the things you uh, talked about in the essay which is something i've uh, wondered about for a very long time is the connection between a shamanic initiation and ufo abductions and i almost feel like lacking those shamanic initiations um at all in our culture that maybe this phenomena has taken that role yes and and um in john mack's final book passport to the cosmos he writes uh he writes about this as does um in the book supernatural by graham hancock he he explores those same ideas yes so that is one way of looking at it and my sense is you know um uh, we are, I mean, I, this is me, I sense we collectively, humanity, are adrift. We are, our spirituality is lacking, our, technologi- our technology is expanding, they're not jiving together. Uh, something's not right with, with the world. Um, and in one sense, you know, would it help to have more shamans around? I mean, I sure, you know, so is this like a mass shamanic initiation for people to then play the role of shaman? Now, some people actually have UFO. This is, this is also very common. They get, you know, people get a heavy, weird UFO sighting, close up sighting. And then the next thing they know, they're psychic. And I mean, I know a handful of, you know, working psychics, you know, that, that are supporting themselves by doing psychic sessions. And I've done some, I've done sessions with these folks. I trust that their skills are very real. And, you know, they trace their experiences back to a UFO experience. Um, Not every psychic can say that, but um, it is a pattern. And so, you know, you know, where psychic and UFO sighting and owls overlap and shamanic initiation. Yeah. These things are all very blurry and we can only, I guess in one sense, trust our gut a little bit as we, as I proceed forward or, you know, with this kind of research as well as, you know, sort of trust the mood of the story rather than the, the, the sort of pragmatic facts of the story, because, you know, oftentimes the stories won't jive exactly. You'll have to sort of, you'll have to sort of trust the flavor of these experiences. Yeah. There was a, a quote from C.S. Lewis that said something to the effect of, um, you know, a world with a shamanic influence is fine. A world where all our shamans is even better, but one way or the other, we have to go. We can't have none. Yeah, that's it's interesting. Yeah, I agree. And the uh... I, I've completely butchered that quote, but that was the general idea. Like, we either need a shamanic presence, uh, however you want to interpret that in our society, or we all need to go to that level. And right now, we have nothing. Well, I think we do have, well, we, in a weird way, we have little things. We have, you know, we have, uh, you know, uh, there's folks who play the role of shaman that, that are out there in society. You know, you can have to well, dig, yeah, yeah. dig for up a little bit. There's a woman in my town here who does, you know, Reiki therapy, and she's pretty, you know, she's ready to go pretty deep with her, you know, with the, the stuff she does. So this is a small town in the middle of Idaho. There's, a you know, one woman, she's in the phone book, and you can go and have a Reiki <laughs> session with her, and she treats it as it seems like something This, I mean, I sense that, you know, if I was in some, you know, village in the jungles of Peru or something or Brazil, you know, I would walk to the edge of the village and confront the shaman, and, I, you know, it's, that wouldn't be something, you know, I would sit and ask the questions, <clears> and the <throat> shaman would, you know, use whatever mystical means they had to attempt to give me the answers, and... Um, and I suspect the answer is the shaman, the gifted shaman in the jungles of Brazil, you know, would be imperfect in the same way that, that this woman who lives in my town, her her interpretations may be imperfect. But it is a little, you know, a signpost along the way. Yeah, yeah. But it's not the same type of thing. It's not uh, where everyone goes through some sort of initiation at some point. Like, like even the, the initiation from... From childhood to adulthood is mostly gone at this point. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I mean, unless you're a, a woman, where the, where the initiation, you know, God thrusts that on you, and you, you know, you right, have your menses right. at a certain point in your youth, and then you're, you know, you you go from girl to woman, and you know that that and I mean, going from boy to man is, you know, there are all kinds of rituals um, that used to be played out, and they're not really played out now. I mean, rebelling yeah. against your parents is like the only one that really, you know, still, you know, holds true in a way. 
Yeah, yeah, and that's that's in some ways almost like an after effect of not having that there. Yes. You know, we have we don't have a way of coping with this transition, so we rebel against our parents. Yeah. I'm trying to find that quote real quick because uh, it was a really yeah. Here's the quote. Um, it was from his book Miracles. A society where the simple may ab- obey the few seers can live. A society where all were seers could live even more fully. But a society where the mass is still simple and the seers are no longer attended to can achieve only superficiality, baseness, ugliness, and in the end, extinction. On or back we must go. To stay here is death. Oh, that's that's great. That's really interesting because I think of, I mean, I you know, I have, I think, there's a segment of the population, like a controlling segment, let's say, you know, the people who, uh, you know, on the, you know, editorial board of the New York Times that would uh, dismiss with contempt any notion of these mystical experiences, you know, that, and they may yeah. go to the church on Sunday and then talk about, you know, things that happened 2000 years ago, but they ain't going to factor them in now. In my sense is they're going out all the time, all around us every day. And we are, you know, we have been trained to be non-observant. We have been trained, or I mean, I feel like I was in the world that I grew up in, to to ignore, to deny these things. Um, so that was a big part of my, oh, my coming to terms with this stuff. You know, I mean, that was that was basically Kristen, you know, telling me to quit my goddamn whining and do something. You know, <laughs> and that 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 something is. Uh, treating this stuff as a real not real i put real in quotes because i don't even know what real is anymore um you know treating this stuff as as something that has invaded the fabric of our reality yeah and always has and always has yeah and i think it was just known as different things back in the in older times like yeah like valet said you had the fairy faith you had the angels and demons and such that were all probably part of the same phenomena and i'm sure that you know uh, you know, the Native American mystics, you know, really were going into the woods and having, you know, an owl appear before them. And quite honestly, yeah. I mean, I've talked to people who have had psychic downloads coming directly from the owl- owls. I've talked to more than one person that has had that. Um, and I'm, you know, in so, you know, we like sort of giggle at primitive societies and, you know, that we're, we're all these sort of privileged Westerners and, and, you know, like you read a little tale it reads like a fairy tale where the where the you know the ancient you know the whatever the native american medicine man you know sits on a mountaintop and and goes through his vision quest and you know then a and then a deer appears before him or an owl or an eagle and that that you know gives him a very direct message i mean that is what is happening with some of these owl experiences there is a very direct message being given uh mm-hmm. you know this i just talked to a fellow this is actually interesting this is the same fellow who I talked about earlier, Chris Bledsoe, his father died recently. I actually had the chance to meet his father briefly earlier this year. Um, and uh, so his father was in poor health. It was was not a surprise that he passed. But um, after the funeral, the whole family, this is the family that was initially very wary to trust what he was saying. The whole family was in the car pulling out of the funeral I mean the church and the cemetery are both one and the same so the church service and the burial all took place at one location they were pulling out pouring rain and there was an owl on a branch impossible to miss as they pulled out of the of the um, where the funeral was Uh, everyone in the car sort of sensed the same thing this was a sign this was a positive beautiful sign from from the beyond uh and they all recognized it as such um it's not up to me to interpret it what it may or may not mean that's up to them individually but you know my sense is you know that that these things are happening and people are uh you know i I sense that these things are happening more often than not and then people are either not sharing them publicly or whispering them in private well it's very likely because people you know are trained to think that stuff like that's crazy exactly so all right well you're, you are working on a book about this whole subject correct i am have you settled on a title yet i have not no the working <laughs> title right now is uh uh owls synchronicity and the ufo abductee i suspect that'll turn into the subtitle 
Um, mm. Though it is pretty. I mean, I'm all for like super, you know, straight, clear titles. I'm not in. I mean, I, even though I do enjoy a pun every once in a while, I don't like it in the title of a book. Right. So. Okay. Yeah, you don't have a deadline set on that. I do not have a deadline, um, and I should because it'll just it might just sort of go on into infinity if I don't have a deadline. So, uh, <laughs> but I do have certainly have a lot of material at this point. Like I'm sort of the problem now is I have too much material. Like the book is too mm. long as far as like what I have in my, you know, on my hard drive as far as so I've got to, uh, you know, at this point all I have is like a report after report after report, and I'm you know I'll speculate a little about one might what one might mean and. Um, so yeah, at this point now I'm like, it would be irresponsible for me to like, you know, put out a 900 page book on the subject. So, um, <laughs> I, it needs to be, it would be whatever boring the reader isn't, you know, that would be the, I would be, uh, you know, not taking my role as author very seriously if that was what happened. So, um, and your website is what? My website is hidden experience.blogspot.com. Um, you can just type in my full name, Mike Cleland, uh, and it should come right up. Uh, if you put Mike Cleland Owls, it'll come up. But so, but hidden experience. And your last name is spelled C L E L L A N D. Correct. Okay. And uh, if people could share their owl stories with you. I would love to hear some owl stories. You have one where you said you said eight owls came out of your tree in your front yes. yard. Yes. Yep. Yep. Numerous times. And we're just swarming around the whole area. Numerous times. Interesting. Yeah. You've had these paranormal experiences. You've been sort of dabbling in these, you know, uh, odd. Uh, you know what little you've shared to me that uh, that does not <laughs> surprise me that that these owls are manifesting plus the fact that you've seen ufos now i don't you know like th there would be some people who would jump to the conclusion and i've had people do it to me and i don't like it where they'll say oh you're a ufo abductee i have no evidence of that so i won't say that but there are others who would uh but there is this kind of funny maybe category what i'm not even sure what maybe means you know like you're the fact that owls are living in your front yard i take that as a very strong clue and you've I'm, you said you've experienced a lot of synchronicity oh yeah yeah yep very interesting very interesting but, don't know but, quite but, what to make of it but to me however i would say i'm not a ufo abductee but i've interfaced with the phenomena on a completely different level from a completely different direction like i've taken a different path up that mountain and then there are there are UFO abduction researchers who would like hear you say that they would take the letter that you sent them and crumble it up and put it in the trash by saying. <laughs> so. Well, I wouldn't be sending it to UFO researchers, so you know. Exactly. Yeah. So so they're not going to hear about it. So they're going to make their they're going to come to conclusions that are not fully informed, in the in the in the in the True. grand, uh, you know. And and I don't think that I don't think that anyone is capable of sort of juggling all the moving parts of this mystery. No. In any kind of meaningful way. So. Um, so if you read a book by a UFO abduction researcher, just be very aware that you're only looking at one small little part of the overall mystery. Yeah, and, that, and to say small, I think it's almost infinitesimally small. I think whatever is really going on is going to require a, like a redefinition of what reality is. Exactly, and that little small thing, like a tapestry, is connected, or a spider web is connected all over the place to other divergent, yeah. you know, weirdness. All right. Well, uh, people can find on your site, they can find the essay you've written on, on the owl phenomena. You've talked a little bit about that, as well as a timeline of your experiences. Uh, you have a bunch of interviews you've done up on there. Uh, what else is there? Uh, there's a lot of, there's some essays, um, a lot of stuff that I just find interesting. You know, sometimes I'll find an interesting YouTube video, I'll post that. I try, I don't post every day. I know there are people who feel like this need, you know, if they're a blogger, like, I have to post every day, and then you, you know... 90% of it is kind of mediocre. So if something shows up and it's interesting, I'll post it online. I've been, um, you know, uh, a lot of my own experiences. And it's interesting. There are, you know, if you, if you scroll back to the very beginning, you can sense the tension and the anxiety in, in it's not, it's not hidden. It's right there. And, um, and I think I've calmed down. I think I've chilled out a bunch <laughs> in the four and a half years or so that I've been doing this. All right. Well, good luck with everything, and we'll have you back hopefully at some point, maybe when the book is done. Great. Yeah, great. I'll, I'm around, and, and uh, this was a delight. Yeah, and I, and I, I, before, like I hadn't heard of your show, and, and I think you contacted me and asked me to be a guest, and I, yes. I, I tapped into your show, and I knew right away, like, oh, yeah, yeah, i got to do this, because there was just, I think it was the um, uh, Maria Wheatley's interview that, that mm. uh, I was like, oh, yeah, you, I, I sensed you were whatever. You and I are on the same page in a lot of ways. 
And, and that's what I sensed when I heard you on the Grelian Report, which is why I reached out to you to have you on. Great. So, uh, was uh, the Maria Wheatley interview, is that the one where you got the impression she had an owl? You know what it was, is just before that, I had interviewed um, Colin, excuse me, um, Colin Andrews. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I thought in the middle of the interview, like, I had this list of questions, like, oh, God, this guy's out in the fields, he's in, like, the magical part of England, he's, you know, in the crop circles, you know, and he's got to have owl experiences. So I asked him, so, Colin, have you ever had any owl experiences? He's like, no, never. Don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, oh, drat. And then I heard (laughs) Maria Wheatley's, and I'm like, and then there was, like, kind of this intuitive knowing, like, oh, yeah, she's going to have some owl experiences. She had had a great one, which was uh, she and a friend were wanted to go uh, on a walk and there's a little trail near where they lived and she lives in the heart of uh, Wiltshire County where all the sacred sites and all the crop circles are so she uh, was walking down a path and an owl swooped in front of her a white owl swooped in front of her and both her and her friend recognized it right away they said that's like we can't go down the path now like that was that was what they they got from the owl so they turned around and from there they walked up a hill and got this beautiful view from this top of this hill, and they watched the sunset, and as they were up there, they saw this really intense UFO sighting, this orange orb translucent light that turned into a giant cigar-shaped craft and then morphed back into a little dot of light and moved around in the sky in a very strange way. And so, you know, here's a, you know, there's an owl and UFO experience that is, you know, that are, that in my opinion, are, are entangled together in a way that I can't untangle. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again, Mike. Uh, The last exit for the lost is up next.